Greetings, brethren, and welcome to another Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, sorry about the opening there, just clicked on the wrong button. So it looked like we were going to study Colossians, but in fact, it is uh, Psalms tonight. Uh, God willing, we'll study uh, Psalms 104. And it really is a good idea to go back into the archives because all of the scriptures tie together. And the more we understand one book, the better we'll understand another book. And so we just have to be constantly going back through the different books as we increase our understanding, and especially uh, the book of Revelation. As I mentioned um, this evening, God willing, we'll cover uh, Psalm 104, uh, such a beautiful psalm. And uh, as, I, as I was studying this psalm, I couldn't help but think of my, my aunt. Uh, her name is Eldika, and I'd appreciate your, your prayers for her. Um, she is every year on my birthday when I speak to her, uh, she will always remind me that uh, I was a newborn baby in a basket at her wedding. And uh, she always just gets a little chuckle out of reminding me of that. So sort of think of baby Moses, but instead of on the river uh, at, at a wedding. <laughs> so uh, this year, though, uh, when I called her and I spoke with her and I, I had to remind her that I was at her wedding and she just did not remember. She said, sorry, she doesn't remember. Her mind is not, her mind is going funny, she said. And then shortly after that, uh, two days later, uh, she was out uh, at the bank and fell and uh, really struck her head uh, very, very hard. And so there's internal bleeding. She's in the hospital now. And uh, so just appreciate your prayers uh, for her. Again, her name is uh, Eldika. Uh, so thank you for that, brethren. Also, just a quick point that we had mentioned um, getting together with some of you uh, who have been following us for a while, and we, we, we know you uh, kind of virtually, but have never met. Uh, we're going to be doing, we were planning on doing a social this Sunday, but the timing didn't work well, and neither does next Sunday. So we're going to put this off uh, for the, I believe the date is the 21st, uh, the, I think it's the third Sunday in uh, February. So, uh, you know, reach out to us and we'll be reaching out to some of you and just looking forward to uh, getting to know you uh, face to face. And we have a, a platform that we'll be using for that. Let's open with a word of prayer and then get into tonight's study. Uh, Heavenly Father, we, we come before you, Lord God Almighty, and just praise you. We praise you, Father, for your glorious character and your glorious works and your great mercy uh, toward your people and ultimately toward all, all of mankind. Uh, thank you, Father, for bringing us into this uh, covenant relationship with you. Thank you for watching over us. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you, Father, that no matter how chaotic uh, this world is in which we live, that we can be uh, solid by standing on the solid rock. And we can, we can take consolation and comfort in your promises to the fathers, the patriarchs. Thank you, Lord God Almighty. Uh, bless our study, deepen our understanding, and deepen our faith and conviction. We pray in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Amen, brethren. So let's um, get into the study for today. And uh, we want to look at Psalm 104. But um, before we go to Psalm 104, Psalm 104 is kind of a, a sister to Psalm 103. They open and close in a very similar fashion. I remember with Psalm 103, it opened with, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, uh, bless his holy name. And then it concluded with, Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Uh, and then it went on to say, um, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Now this uh, Psalm 103 was really an exhortation to, to praise God. Now Psalm 104 is going to open in a similar way, but it's more about um, looking at the creation and understanding how powerful God is from the creation. And the psalmist now, when we, when we read this psalm, you just get a sense of great intimacy and awe and really knowing God uh, through, through his works. Um, and, and I just think of, again, these are sort of in this enthronement, um, victory, book of the uh, Psaltery. Uh, so just try to think of the time now God is on earth and his people know him. They're no longer estranged, estranged from him. They know him. And they're able to uh, serve as physical priests on the earth to the rest of humanity. And, and the condition today, uh, in Isaiah 8 and verse 17, uh, Isaiah writes, And I will wait upon the Lord. And, and he describes him as he that hides his face from the house of Jacob. So this intimate knowledge of God that we're about to read in Psalm 104 Jacob doesn't have this understanding today. 
They don't have this intimate relationship with God today, but it's coming. And that's his promise to Abraham. That's his promise to Jacob, in fact. When these men are resurrected, they will see God's promises fulfilled. And so we are going to see a time when the children of Israel will, in fact, know God with the intimacy that we're, we're about to read about. Uh, but here, yeah, Isaiah says, I will look for him. And, and to fulfill that, or to sort of looking forward to that time when this will no longer be the case where God hides his face from Jacob, Jeremiah says, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, you should know the Lord. For they shall all know me, he says, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity. And people want to say how, how evil the Jews are and that they couldn't possibly be God's people. No, they are God's people. And he will cleanse them, he will purify them, and he will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. So as we fast forward uh, into the future, uh, we are going to have these tribes of Israel, uh, and specifically the tribe of Judah, in a very um, uh, prestigious position, an exalted position on the earth. And then people around the earth will be saying, you know, oh, you're a Jew, I want to hold on to your garment and, and go with you to Jerusalem and be taught about the God of Israel from you. So this, all of that to say, there's quite a, a solid understanding of God uh, and, and this is written thousands of years ago, and there's quite a solid understanding of who God is in this psalm. Now, I said it, I, it reminds me of my aunt, uh, Eldika, because every time I call her, uh, she's such a genuine person, and she just has this awe of God. And she will always find in, in our conversation to remind me of how mighty God is. And she'll, she'll point out just how vast the creation is, and that this God we serve looks after the entire creation. And, and while she tells me, and she tells me like in every conversation I have with her, while she tells me this, it's like she's realizing herself just how profound our God is. And, and this, that's what we're going to read here in Psalm 104, just a great sense of how profound our God is. So he says here, Bless the Lord, O my soul. So similar to Psalm 103, which we're going to see a different uh, take on it here, where he's going to really focus not so much on continuing to exhort people to praise God, but just to point out how powerful this God is. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. And again, this is my, my, aunt, my aunt. Uh, when I talk to her, she's just she's in awe of God and what how, how he holds the whole creation together. And she'll remind me of how many people there are, are on the earth and that he looks after all of these people. She says, he says, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. So this is somebody who knows God and understands God and is able to say, God is clothed with honor and majesty. Who covers yourself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. So, so he, he, he covers himself with light. The way, the way we put on clothes, God puts on light. And this is how glorious he is. And then he's able to stretch out the heavens the way we would, we would stretch out a curtain. Who lays the beams. <clears throat> Let's get my mouse working here who lays the beams of his chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks upon the wings of the wind. And I don't think the psalmist here is speaking figuratively. Uh, I think this is real. He, he makes the clouds his chariot. And, and he's returning with the clouds. And, and Ezekiel had a vision of him coming in, in a chariot. And he walks upon the wings of the wind. And, and we, will, we will be born into his family. We will be just like him. And we will also operate in this fashion. He says, Who makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. This is how powerful the, this, this angelic realm is. Uh, it, it is an extremely powerful creation that he has made in the angels. And, and the, the um, Apostle Paul, I believe it's Paul in Hebrews, quotes this very thing 
when he is talking of the glory of Jesus Christ. And he quotes in Psalm uh, Hebrews 1 and verse 7, and of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers flames of fire. So he is also quoting this psalm, but he's quoting it to position how great Jesus Christ is. And the psalmist himself is saying the same thing. Oh, Lord, you are very great, extremely great. You, you, you make these angels that are so incredibly powerful and glorious, and you're the creator of the, this power. He says, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. And I think this is a very important psalm, that the earth itself is the foundation, or, or, or he laid the foundations of the earth and, and listen to what he says, that it should not be removed forever. So the earth is forever. And I saw a bit of discussion uh, today in the chat, or sorry, in, in Slack, about um, the earth and whether in the future uh, God will turn the earth into something spiritual as opposed to material. And I think, brethren, we just have to be very, very careful. It's a good question, but we have to be careful about how we think about the earth. That the earth is something that God glories in, the material earth. And matter is something that matters to God. And, and we need to be careful that we don't fall into this sort of, and it's, it's something that's easy to do, to fall into this platonic way of seeing creation. And the platonic or the Greek way of seeing creation is that matter is evil. Matter is just completely something that should be despised. And, and, and Satan put this into man so that man rejects the earth the way he did and is seeking to live in heaven in this spiritual realm and have no regard for the earth the way he had no regard for the earth. But God created the earth. And after Satan rejected it, God came to earth and made a replica of himself from the earth to demonstrate just how much he, he loves the earth and his vision and plan for the earth. And so he says here, that he laid the foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed forever. And, and it's not just the earth, there's a whole massive universe that is made out of matter. And, and God has plans for this matter. Uh, matter was not made uh, for, for temporary human beings. Matter was made for, the, for, for spiritual beings. Uh, the, 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 the temporary human beings, the, the, this is just a a 6,000 year phase. In fact, in Job 38 and verse four, when, when Job was getting a bit uppity in terms of his role in the earth, God says, where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? And here we just read that the foundations of the earth, uh, he laid them that they should not be removed forever. But God asked Job, where were you when, you, when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Do you really understand what, what I'm doing with the earth? Who has laid the measures thereof, if you know? Or who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the corner stone thereof? Like, where were you, Job? Well, you weren't there. In fact, no human being was there. But let me tell you who was there. He says, when the morning stars, that's the angels, spiritual beings, before they had no clue about human beings being created from the earth. But when, when God created and brought the physical universe into existence, the angels sang together. And all the sons of God shouted for joy. And where were you, Job, when this happened? These were spiritual beings, and God created this physical matter, and they shouted for joy over the physical matter. And we now are going to inherit this. We're going to inherit all things with Christ. And so we are going to be spiritual beings, but we are going to inherit this physical universe. And, and we're going to unlock all the secrets of matter, that that matter has tremendous secrets. Imagine that, that God himself can come down to this ball of matter and out of it create a living replica of himself. That that gives you a sense of what is, what is embedded in this matter and the type of energy that can be released, and the science that, that the deep science that needs to be understood to fully unlock the potentiality of matter. So, so we need to reject Plato, and we need to reject Greek philosophy, 
that would want us to despise things physical. God, God rejoices over this. And the, the angels, when, when he created physical matter, they rejoice because they, they saw the whole potential of what can be done and what can be unlocked. And they were probably astonished when they saw God come to earth and make a, rep, a living replica of himself. They probably didn't realize that that was possible. So, so this psalmist now is just amazed at the foundations of the earth and, and, and what God has done. He says, you covered it with the deep. As with a garment, the waters stood above the mountains. And so, uh, you know, this whole creation before uh, was covered in water. And the waters stood above the mountains. At, at your rebuke, and, and, and through Noah, he, he flooded the earth with water. But at your rebuke, they fled. At the voice of your thunder, they hasted away. And so that could refer to Genesis, um, the creation account in Genesis 1. Could also refer to the, the, the flood account with Noah uh, and what happened there and how he caused the, the, the waters to, to, to recede. At your rebuke, the waters fled. And water is powerful. Water is tremendously powerful. Again, talk about the power of matter. Uh, water is an extremely powerful force. But at the word of God, they fled, and you even think of um, Christ in the storm when he just rebuked the storm and the waters just subsided. At your rebuke, they fled. At the voice of your thunder, they hasted away. They go up by the mountains. They go down by the valleys unto the place where you have founded them. And again, what the, the subject matter here is the waters. And, and, and the psalmist is just so amazed at God's way with the water. So, so this is something, again, as we consider how great God is, we need to consider just, just the waters and how wonderful these waters are. And so if you just uh, look at this uh, here to see just how beautiful and powerful water is. And God, God is the orchestrator of all of this, that God looks after all of this. It's absolutely amazing. He says that, and just keep, keep this uh, image in mind, and he says here, uh, they go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys unto the place where you have found for them. And you can see the water just falling into the valley and then creating a stream and, and going to the place where God has designed and, and goes to the place which you have founded for them. You have set a bound that they may not pass over. So as powerful as water is, uh, and, and, and how irresistible water is to human beings, water will have its way with us. And yet God has set a boundary on this water, that it, it cannot pass over the boundaries that God has set for it, that they turn not again to cover the earth. And, and what's amazing here is we read this um, psalmist's uh, praise of God and his work in the creation is, is thousands of years ago, that the Hebrews understood that God is very much involved in his creation. That it's not that God is just, uh, you know, first of all, you know, the people who believe that there's no such thing as God, the psalmist is able to look at the creation the way my aunt does and just think like, wow. And she would always say, what a mighty God we serve. And this is what the psalmist is, what a mighty God we serve. But he understands as well, the psalmist understands, forget the atheists, they're fools. But there's also the deist that says, well, yeah, okay, we accept that this creation, of course, it has to be created. It couldn't just evolve or just come out of nothing. So we, we acknowledge that there's a creator. But then there, the, the deist says, well, the creator is more like a watchmaker, that he designs the watch. But once the watch is up and running, that's it. Everything just works and, and, and uh, the, the watchmaker is no longer involved in the life of the watch. Well, here the Hebrew... Uh, mindset is fully understands that that's just not true. That in order for the creation to continue to function, the creator needs to be fully involved. And that's what he's showing here. That all of these um, powerful and, and awesome uh, just feats of nature, that the designer, the creator, is very much involved. And this just brings him into this incredible state of praise of God. So the, the, as powerful as water is, oceans and seas and rivers and lakes, there are boundaries for this water. You have set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they turn not again to cover the earth. Even though the earth was fully in, immersed in water, it's impossible now 
for this to ever happen again. You know, every time we see the rainbow, we know God's promise that this will never, ever, ever, ever happen again. The earth is going to be covered in fire. That we know that. But water will never cover the earth again. And this, this is the promise of God. So I, I think it'd be easy to prove the Bible a, a myth and, and nonsensical just by showing and being able to predict that one day the whole earth will be immersed in water again. And, and the scripture, the Hebrew here says, absolutely impossible. It won't happen, that there are boundaries to the water. He says, he sends the springs into the valleys, which run among the hills. And again, you get the sense of the, the water falling into these valleys and then, and then um, running along uh, the valley into a spring. Uh, and and this, is, this is beautiful. And, and all of this water, as it you know, evaporates and then comes back down and it fills the, the, the reservoirs, he says here, and this is again, this, I just, every time I read this, I just think of my aunt, uh, what a mighty God we serve. She, she, he, he says here, they give drink, these waters give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. So this is somebody who's really just taking into the whole account and, and how the whole creation just works harmoniously together. And he's looking at this and saying, wow, this is amazing. The waters are controlled, and, and in the boundaries that God has set for them, they give drink to every beast of the field. And the wild donkeys, they're out there running and doing everything that they do, and they get thirsty, and they can quench their thirst with this water. He says, by them, the waters, shall the fowls of the heaven have their habitation, which sing among the branches. So the trees rely on this water in order to grow up and then provide shelter or lodging for the birds. It's somebody that's just taking into the whole way the creation just works seamlessly together. And he says, which, so this is now Christ when he was on earth. Uh, so just think about what the psalmist observed, how these trees provide uh, lodging for the birds. And when Christ himself, the creator, was on earth, in Matthew 13, 32, he says, which indeed is the least of all seeds, speaking of the mustard seed, but when it is grown, and it depends on the waters to grow, when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. So this psalmist, as he's looking at the creation and he's realizing just how amazing, how, how well designed the whole creation is and how these waters that once covered the entire earth have now been controlled and, and, and in, in, instead of just destroying the earth, they're controlled and they bring life to the earth. And he's observing how the wild animals are able to be nourished from the water, but even trees grow up as a result of the water. And then the birds that fly through the air, they have a place to land in these trees because of the water. And then when the creator himself is on earth, he, he, he gives us this parable and he himself observes the beauty of the design that he himself created. But he's, he's pointing out just how harmoniously and beautifully all of this works in order to make uh, the point that he's making about the, the mustard seed. Back to um, Psalm 103, uh, 104, verse 13. He says that God, God is actively involved in the creation. We, we can't fall into this deist mentality that yes, God created everything, but he's not involved anymore. It all just sort of runs automatically. No, the, the, the psalmist is saying, no, in or, God is not just the creator, he's also the sustainer. And he says, he waters the hills from his chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your works. So all of this works from, from God is active, making all of this happen and sustaining it. And then again, in this uh, observation, of what is going on in the earth, what does he say? He says this. So let me just go back a little bit. The mouse seems to be acting up. He says this, that he causes the grass to grow for the cattle. And again, you can just uh, imagine this, that the cattle, the, the, these beasts of, 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 of burden, these beasts of the earth, he causes the grass through this miracle of the water, this miraculous nature of the water, that he then causes the, the earth 
the or the grass to grow uh, for the cattle, and the herb for the service of man. And and so many of our medicines actually depend upon these herbs, and and these herbs serve us. And this is all in the creation, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. This is what God is doing, that that the whole creation can benefit from what God does. And not only that, but and wine that makes glad the heart of man. So the psalmist acknowledges that wine is a blessing of God. And unlike some religions, religions that teach that man mustn't touch alcohol and that they're very strict and you know they, they will punish you if you touch alcohol. No, the, the, the psalmist, in looking at what the Creator has done, is acknowledging that even wine is in the design of this great God. And wine that makes, the, makes glad the heart of man. So man is able to uh, just enjoy fellowship you know, at a level, a, a different level, when, when wine and this food is served, and, and even um, you know, God himself, when he uh, was with Abraham, uh, bread and wine, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. And all of this depends on God's orchestration with the water and what God does with the water. He says, The trees of the Lord are full of sap, Again, this is depending on the water, that the sap requires the water. So the trees require the water to grow up and provide um, uh, habitation for the birds and and herbs for for the service of man. Um, But also they're full of sap from the water. And the cedars of of Lebanon, which he has planted. So these, these, and we, we don't quite fully appreciate this, but at the time to understand these powerful trees, these massive trees, which God has planted, where the birds make their nests. And as for the stork, the fir trees are her house. So there's just, again, this this fascination with the birds and just seeing how these birds that just fly through the sky, that that, that these powerful, these, these big trees, massive trees, they're able to make their nests in these trees. And the stork, uh, fir trees are, are her house. So this beauty of creation, all around us. He says, the high hills are a refuge for the wild goats and the rocks for the conies. This is somebody who really appreciates creation and the natural order and how it all works harmoniously together, but understands that it's the creator and the sustainer that is making all of this work so phenomenally. And this is what's causing him to just say, God, you are very great. Look, look what you look what you're doing here. Now, this also speaks to the whole notion of environmentalism, that man thinks that he has to step in to save the planet, and 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 you know, man thinks that because of him, everything's going sideways, and unless he steps in, then you know, the whole creation will fall apart, and that is an atheistic statement. Here, the psalmist understands, no, God is running all of this, and God loves the earth, and God will, in fact, look after the earth, and the earth is not going anywhere. He laid the foundations in such a way that the earth will abide forever. So we don't need these arrogant um, uh, environmentalists who are are dreaming up this communistic religion where the creation becomes more important than man, and man must die in order to save a blade of grass. And man means nothing. Man is garbage. This is, this is a wrong mindset. And God is, what the psalmist is saying is, God is very much able to look after his creation. Thank you very much. And the earth is not going anywhere. And in fact, we know from Revelation 11, Revelation 11 and verse 18, he says, and the nations were angry. This is a looking, looking forward now, just a few years ahead of us. And the nations were angry and your wrath has come. God is angry, brethren. God God is returning with wrath. We need to know this. Your wrath has come. And the time of the dead, that they should be judged. And that you should give reward unto your servants, the prophets. So they're all looking forward to their resurrection. And to the saints. And them that fear your name. And we're all looking forward to our change or our resurrection. This is real. This is happening. This is just around the corner. Small and great. And what else? 
and should destroy them which destroy the earth. Satan hates the earth. God loves the earth. And God doesn't need environmentalists to save the earth. He, he, is, he is very well capable. And the psalmist is realizing just how glorious the, the, the earth is and how it all works together so intricately because God is still involved. And God is very much involved. In Psalm 24 and verse 1, we read, The earth is the Lord's. The earth belongs to God. And the fullness thereof, all this spectacular harmony that the psalmist in 104 is looking at, all of this belongs to God. The, all of the wealth and, and, and the abundance that the earth yields, it all belongs to God. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and them that dwell therein. So these um, atheists who believe that they're the only ones that can save the planet, uh, we don't need this, this uh, uh, communistic, atheistic religion to take us over and cause us to exalt the creation above man. And, and man can no longer eat, uh, man, can heart, man can no longer breathe. We, 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 we're, we, we're just despi we must despise ourselves and cover our faces in shame and, and not realize we're made in God's image. And God very much is concerned with the earth and God glorifies the earth and he will be glorified in the earth. The earth isn't going anywhere. Psalm 104 and verse 19. He appointed the moon for seasons. And uh, I think most of us would know to, to that this word seasons is the, the Hebrew word mo'adim, mo'adim, which is appointed times. And we know that uh, is exactly what we see in Genesis. So he appointed the reason he, the moon is there. So the psalmist is looking at this creation and realizes that the moon is part of a timekeeping system. And he appointed the moon, the months, for seasons. So we would know which month are these appointed times. The sun knows it's going down. So the sun is there as part of the day cycle, and the moon is there for the monthly cycle. And here in Genesis 1, verse 14, and most of us are aware of this, but I'll just mention it. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and the word here is seasons, and let them be for seasons is again that same Hebrew word, Mo'adim. So they're there for seasons or better uh, appointed festivals. So there are there, the, the God has a worship system that he has created, which in fact is a prophetic system. That when we understand the, in Le Le Leviticus 23, when we understand the outline of these appointed times, that man is called and summoned to worship the creator at these particular times, that they are in fact prophetic. That that Taken together, they, they show the plan of God, and they unfold for us the plan of God. He says, let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. He says, you make darkness, and it is night. So he, he's the one that created this pattern of night and day. And, and, and this, this worshiper of, of God is looking and saying, you actually make darkness, and it's night. Wherein all the beasts of the field do creep forth. So at night, he, he sees all these insects and, and mammals and reptiles and all these animals come out at night uh, in the forest and they function. They have eyes that can see at night, they can function at night. And that's what happens when, when the night falls, they come forth. He says, The young lions do roar after their prey. So he's even looking at the power of these lions. And saying, man, this is this is something incredible. That when he looks at these lions and sees how they roar after their prey, we'll just look look at this one here. This this um, video we see here with these lions. He says, this is majestic. The lions roar after their prey, and seek their meat from God. So yeah, this is pretty. This is pretty vicious. But the psalmist is saying, this is God's design. This is how they actually look to God to be fed. So they seek their meat from God. He says, the sun arises, they gather themselves together. This is, this is the psalmist scene. The sun arises, they gather themselves together and lay them down in their dens. So they're out at night hunting and looking for food from God. And then when the sun comes up, they rest. They go and they lie themselves down. And then when the sun comes up and they go and lie down, man goes forth unto his work. 
So, so we actually absolutely depend on the light and, and less so now uh, because of uh, electricity. But certainly um, we, we, we understand that daytime is when uh, men are designed to work. And so we see all this busyness during the day. Man goes forth unto his work and to his labor until the evening. And that certainly is the natural course of events where men are working during the day uh, because that we need the light of the sun. And then when the sun goes down, we go down. But when the sun goes down, the beasts come out and they do all of their hunting and, and the insects and everything that operates at night. Uh, and then when, when, when the day comes, they all do their resting and man comes forth and does his work and to his labor until the evening. He's just fascinated at how all of this works. And this is, this is really what men should do is just pause and just go out into the natural world and look how it all works so gloriously. And, and the Hebrew mindset is to understand this is not just an automatic pilot, that God did not just create this, he also sustains it. He says, O oh Lord, and you can just hear the praise, O oh Lord, how manifold or various are your works, exclamation mark, like, wow. Again, what my aunt would say, what a mighty God we serve. She just surveys all of this. O oh Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom, you have made them all. So there is a design that went behind all of this and a very deep and profound wisdom. And, and we, we will fully understand when God is here and explains to us the design. But we can still appreciate it even though we don't fully understand it. He says, in wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your riches. So is this great and wide sea where are things creeping, innumerable, both small and great beasts. So if we were to go into the sea, uh, you know, we're, we're all we're, we're trying to get out to, to Mars, and but we still have not discovered all the things that are in the sea. And, and he says here to us that uh, if, in fact, we could go into the sea, we, we just see all of these creeping and innumerable beasts, both small and great, all kinds there that are extremely powerful. This is what he, he, he sees. In, and this is, he's looking at the earth, but then he's looking into the water and seeing what God is doing there as well. He says, let me just uh, get my mouse here. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan. And I think this is some kind of a powerful sea creature. I uh, just think of the biggest whale that we can think of. And maybe it's even bigger than that. Uh, there go the ships. So these powerful ships go on the sea. And there is that Leviathan whom you have made to play therein. That This is like incredible to him that God is able to make such a powerful beast that is re refined or restricted to the sea. Uh, and it's such a powerful beast and it plays in the sea and God has made it this way. So you think of a puppy or a dog when it's out, you see when dogs play, well, animals play. And to see this massive beast in the sea play, it's like, wow, what a mighty God we serve. These wait all upon you. Notice that every single creature in the creation waits upon God. He says, these wait all upon all of these. Everything that I've just outlined is waiting upon you. That you may give them their meat in due season. And this word season now is it's a different Hebrew word. It's not moadim. It's just in the right time. So all of these creatures are, depend on God. And God is actively involved in sustaining this incredible creation that you give them that you give them they gather you open your hand they are filled with good so what they they depend whatever god gives them that's what they're able to get and he he's the one that opens his hand so that they're filled with good he's actively involved in this mighty creation you hide your face they are troubled so so if for whatever reason god decides no no rain or whatever uh, these animals suffer. The creation, the trees, the foil, foliage, everything will suffer unless God provides. You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, 
they die. So they depend on, on this breath from God. And if God takes that away, that's the end. As mighty as this Leviathan is, God can just cause it to cease to live. You take away their breath, they die, and they and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created. So this is the, the, the there's a spirit that that nefesh requires this this breathing, this breath of life uh, to live. And so he he gives them that, and they are created. And you renew the face of the earth. The earth isn't going anywhere. God is very aware of the earth. And he is sustaining the earth. The glory of the Lord shall endure forever. And this, this glory is reflected in his creation. And it will be reflected in Israel forever. The glory of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in his works. So this, these are his works. And we must be careful not to adopt this platonic mentality that, that despises the earth and despises matter. God loves matter. God is glorified with matter, and he wants us to look at the matter and the intricacy. I remember as a boy, uh, my father buying us a microscope and uh, looking at the smallest things through this microscope, microscope and just being stunned. I had no idea these things were invisible to the, to the naked eye. And just being stunned at the intricacy and the perfection in, in the smallest detail. God wants us to see that. God wants to see that every detail has been considered and that he is glorified in his works and will be forever. The Lord, and he, and he rejoices in these works. When God looks at all of this, the psalmist is looking at all of this and he's in awe. And he acknowledges and realizes that God himself rejoices in his works. You know, you think of the, the six days of, of creation. And on the seventh day, he's looking at everything and saying, this is very good. This is he re rejoicing it and wanting to share it with mankind. He looks upon the earth and it trembles. He touches the hills and they smoke. And then the psalmist concluding says, so all of this, the whole time, he's just, the whole psalm is all about the creation and the glory of the creation and how it all just works together so, so beautifully. And then he can, he's now coming to the conclusion by saying, you know what? I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. And no one's going to stop me. I am so full of awe that I can't help but praise God. I will sing unto the Lord. As long as I live, I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. And, and I, I think this is, this is just very healthy for us to just pause. And, and a lot of these nature shows, to watch these nature shows and just see how, how glorious uh, God's creation is. And to take the time to, to, to uh, just see the, the glory of God's creation and praise him. And, and when we sing, to really sing. With, with a sense of, of awe of what God is doing. So he says here, I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. My meditation of him shall be sweet. My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. And I think that's something that Again, nobody can take away from us. It's as crazy as this world is, as chaotic as it is, as it unravels all around us. This joy that we have in God, they can't take that away. It's impossible to take that away. That comes from the inside out. And it comes from acknowledging just how great our God is. He says, my meditation of him shall be sweet. I just, just when I think about God, it's just, it's sweet. And I will be glad in the Lord. And then he says, so as much as he rejoices in, in, in God, he's not naive. He understands that there are many that have decided to worship Satan. There are many that have decided to dishonor God and not understand just how majestic this God is. And he says, let the sinners be destroyed out of the earth. This is the man of God. 
this is the man of God. He's not just he's not saying, oh, let Jesus come and just give the whole world a big hug because Jesus just loves the whole world. God is coming in wrath. And as much as this psalmist is able to worship God and be in awe of him, he also realizes that Satan is active in the earth and, and hijacks the minds of men who want to destroy the earth. And so he concludes by saying, let the sinners be destroyed out of the earth. He doesn't want to see an earth full of sinners. You know, the whole creation works so beautifully together, except for sinful man. So he's looking forward and saying, yeah, let's get this phase over with. Let's remove sinful man from the earth. And then let's have human beings made in the image of God who function harmoniously with the whole creation, everything bringing glory to God's name. Let the sinners be destroyed out of the earth and let the wicked be no more. Excuse me. So we'll have a taste of that through the millennium. Then there's going to be a little hiccup where the wicked will once again uh, thrive, and then that's it. Then they'll be completely wiped out, and we go forward into eternity. And the wicked, the earth will abide forever, but the wicked will be no more. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise ye the Lord. And, and, as, and this is his conclusion. Uh, this is the conclusion of his praise. As he's praising God, he concludes by saying, okay, we've got to remove the wicked. Let the sinners be destroyed out of the earth because they are, the, the earth is just so glorious except for these sinners. Let the sinners be removed out of the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise you, the Lord. So he closes the very same way he opened, very similar to Psalm 103. And as I was reading this, it just reminded me of Revelation 1, verse 7. I always, I'm so amazed with how John writes this, where he says, Behold, he comes with clouds. So He's going to be riding the clouds as he comes. And every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and I think Matthew 23, these are the Jews who destroyed him, but they're going to be looking forward to his return because he's coming to save them, think Zechariah 12, 14. And then he says, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. The return of Jesus Christ is not a happy time for mankind. It's a happy time for the saints, and it's a happy time for the people of the covenant who are being destroyed and persecuted, and he's coming to save them. But for the rest of the tribes of the earth, they're going to wail. They're going to be terrified because of him. And then what does John say? He says, all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And then John says, even so, amen. Even so, amen. Just like the psalmist is saying, let the sinners be destroyed out of the earth and let the wicked be no more. And when Christ is coming, he's coming to put the wicked down. And John says, even so, amen. So, I'm going to conclude the psalm uh, today, brethren, with uh, the same words that uh, my aunt would say to me uh, every time I speak with her, and that is to say, what a mighty God we serve. Jesus Christ is Lord. God bless, brethren. Amen.